Welcome to episode seven of law.mit.edu's idea flow, an opportunity to go deeper into the various facets of the emerging field of computational law. And today we're going to learn about and maybe even in our own particular way, help to brainstorm about future directions for this new field known as computational antitrust. And who better to lead us in this discussion than Thibaut Schreppel, who I think it's fair to say is the recognized global heavyweight thought leader in the area and who has organized the um, very successful recently launched Stanford Law School Computational Antitrust Initiative. Um, which I, I hope that you'll you'll tell us a little bit more about, uh, especially the impressive list of um, governmental regulatory agencies and, and other experts and stakeholders who have jumped right in in a very public way for this initiative. Uh, Thibault is an associate professor of law at VU Amsterdam and also faculty affiliate at Stanford, among many other affiliations. Uh, and uh, and he and I know each other, I think, you know, it, in a sense, I would say through legal hacking circles and adventures. Um, and I just couldn't be more thrilled than to have you join the MIT computational law community today and to have I see brought some of your your posse with you as well to, to help us understand this idea and co think it with you. Um, so I also want to signal that um, our own um, Camila from Brazil uh, is also going to be uh, uh, have a more formal role today as what we call a discussant. And that's because um, she is in her um, legal practice area, um, got a, a quite a, a, a good mix of experience with antitrust and competition law, as well as with computational law and technology law in general. And of course, she is the founder of Sao Paulo Legal Hackers. Um, and so with that, uh, I'd like to hand the baton to you, Thibaut, and uh, with a warm welcome, I invite you to maybe start by um, making a few remarks to uh, further introduce yourself, if you like, and talk about the project, but especially introduce us all to this, what is this idea and what are the problems and prospects for uh, the very idea of computational antitrust? Of course. Um, well, first of all, I'm delighted to to be amongst friends today. I, I like very much the words adventures. I think it characterizes exactly our the context of our meetings. Every time we had a discussion, it's always an adventure and we learn. I mean, I learn a lot from you, so I'm very much looking for our conversation today. Um, the thing I wanted to say also is that I've been listening to the previous uh, episodes, and so it feels a bit like being, you know, um, trapped in the box today because I'm uh, on the other side of the screen, although uh, I'm, I'm not too sure uh, if it means anything nowadays with the digital era, but that's a different topic for a different day. I'm here to talk about, indeed, digital antitrust, <clears throat> and uh, most of all, to, to hear from you and to gather your thoughts and, and, and see if we can make some progress together in just uh, a few uh, minutes, but I'm sure we can. So what we thought we would do is that, that first I will give you a 10 minute ish presentation about what I think computational antitrust is, but feel free to disagree with me. Uh, you'll see I'll be asking you a question um, right after the start, and then we can keep the conversation going. Um, so for that, not so surprisingly, uh, I do uh, not need to share my screen, but um, hopefully you can see my screen, <clears throat> uh, my, my video uh, in full screen. Uh, what I will do is that I will use a presentation that I hope you can see right now. Uh, so as you see, what I've decided to do is to actually open two different tracks. And depending on the, the answer that you will give to the first question I'll be asking you, I will then take one uh, track over the other. So this is, uh, I hope, very much an interactive presentation. Uh, but so before uh, we get started, I need to ask you the question that I want to ask you, which is the following. Should we fight fire with fire? And here in the context of competitional antitrust, what I mean is that should we use computational tools, 
such as AI, and I'm about to be a bit more specific than that, to tackle, for instance, the tech giants. And so for you to answer the question, um, you can take a picture of the QR code that appears on the screen, or you can go to slido.com, and then on the front page, they will be asking you for the even codes, and I've chosen the only even code that I could choose today, DAZA. And so if you just enter that, you will get to answer the question. Um, I'm, I'm not going to wait for, for you all to, to answer the question um, as I speak. I just, I'm just leaving that on the screen for a minute or two. Uh, hopefully, you had the time to take uh, the picture of the QR code or the slido.com and uh, the even code. Uh, but in the meantime, what I want to mention is that the idea of computational law and the idea to be able to compute the law uh, is not entirely new. Of course, what is new, and it's the pace of technology and, and all the technologies that we are about to discuss. Uh, but going a bit back in time, uh, you may be interested in the work of uh, Yebniz and um, in his opinion, and I pretty much have to confess, share the same view. Uh, it would be possible with the right tools to calculate legal outcome. Now, I don't think we have all the right tools to be able to calculate all legal outcomes, uh, but potentially one day we'll reach that. Uh, but again, this is uh, pretty much a philosophical uh, belief, so I'm not going to insist on that today. Something which is closer to the field of antitrust is Richard Posner, um, who in an article published already 20 years ago, uh, noticed that the mismatch between the law time and the time for markets is troubling to say the least, because indeed one goes much faster than the other. Um, of course, there is a question, do we really want lawyers to go faster than markets? Not necessarily, but potentially at the same speeds, uh, uh, that it might be something that we may want to, to, to work upon. So that is the context of my talk today. And being a bit more um, um, uh, aligned with, what ha with, with what's happening on today's markets, if you look at some empirical work, you see that we detect uh, pretty much between uh, 13 and 17% of uh, antitrust infringement, which you could say is not too bad, but it's also not too good. It means that 90% of the time, if you infringe antitrust, you'll be fine and your practice will go undetected. So of course, this is not optimal. So we do have that issue. And if you look at uh, what's happening and what's coming, Unfortunately, there are, there are reasons to be pessimistic, but hopefully today is a, is a space for an optimist conversation, although realist. Um, but what we see according to the OECD is that competition agencies are reactive, meaning that they wait for companies to go to them and to complain when in fact they potentially should be more proactive, which is to go out there on the market and detect practices on their own. But of course, it raises the question as to the means we give to those agencies. The two agencies in the US will get a budget increase, uh, but I don't believe that this is on the map for the European Commission and any other agencies all over the world. So we do have a problem here, the one of detection. As I mentioned already, it's unfortunately not about to become better. Uh, they are, I mean, don't please don't care about the exact number that appears on the screen right now. Those are predictions, so it, it, it's certainly wrong, but the idea is very important. Uh, in 2020, so this one you can trust, we produced all over the world 44 zettabytes of data. I had no idea what a zettabyte was, so I had to check it out. A zettabyte equals 1 trillion gigabytes, which is a lot, um, which is already 40 times more bytes than there are stars in the universe, just to give you a sense of what we are talking about here. But in five years, we'll be producing 175 zettabytes of data, 600 and over 2,000 in just 15 years from now. So it seems that if you don't have the right tools as, as an agency uh, to be proactive, then uh, your job will become increasingly complex. And potentially this is not great news because we want agencies to be able to detect more practices. So that's issue number one. And issue number two is the one after you have detected a potential practice. What do you do? Uh, first, you have the issue of the quantity of the data you need to analyze. Uh, to give you some number, in the Google Shopping case, uh, almost 2 billion, I mean 1.7 billion search queries were analyzed by the European Commission. The CMA had access to Google and Bing search queries for just one week, and they ended up in between 3 and 4 billion data entries to analyze. So you can have lots of interns, but it won't do the trick. Um, and despite the quantity, also the nature of data is something we may want to, to question. 
what do we analyze? Do we focus on static competition and just prices, something that we know how to analyze more or less, or do we want to take into account business science, open the, the firm black box a bit, computer uh, science, behavioral insights, et cetera, et cetera. So those are a few of the questions that we have to, to discuss today and a few of the challenges. Uh, in a bit of a proactive way, I would say we have two solutions we can give up. If we give up, we could say, well, you know what? The, the market will take care of it, which is true most of the time, but sometimes the market needs 50 or 40 years to take care of something. So what do we do in the meantime? That's a, that's a good question, I think. Another one is to say, well, we regulate everything ex ante, which is what's coming in Europe and in the US. But even though you may be doing that, you still end up with potential infringement to ex ante regulation. And therefore, the ability to detect that and to analyze the infringement come, comes back. And so you haven't solved anything by just, just working on, on such regulation. So if you don't give up, you can work on computational antitrust. And so that's the subject of, of my talk today. So now looking at <clears throat> the uh, answer that you, that you give me, uh, gave me, uh, and I'm here putting the answer on the screen. So to show you I'm not lying and uh, making the results uh, myself, 75% of you answer that, yes, it's a good idea to fight fire with fire, and that's therefore computational antitrust is a good idea, or at least an idea we should explore. So going back to my presentation, I'm going to explore the yes track. So first of all, thank you very much. As you can guess, I was a bit biased, and I hoped that you will answer that it is indeed a good idea to explore computational antitrust. Two things I do want to mention, though, um, it, it might be that you answer that to please me. Uh, that's uh, something that we see a lot in behavioral science. So I'm not going to take it for granted that you think computational antitrust is a good idea, but I'm going to try my best to convince you even more. And we do have 25% of you thinking it potentially is not a good idea. So the question becomes, if indeed we should use fire, um, fight fire with fire, which type of fire do we need? Or to put it differently, um, if antitrust without computer science is like Sherlock without Watson, the question is, which Watsons do we need? And so here, what I briefly want to do is to mention three fields of competition law and policy or antitrust, first being anti-competitive practices, the second one being merger control, and then antitrust policy. To be very brief, I mentioned already that we have a detection issue. Here, two of the computational tools, which I will define as computer-based problem-solving methods that we could be using, is to develop APIs. And uh, I believe this is something that uh, we may be discussing, including with uh, DAZA. We juggle with the idea for quite some time that agencies and companies will create flows of data to be able to better understand the markets. Something else that could work and is actually already used by some agencies, I'm not too sure if I can disclose the names, uh, but is to use natural language processing or understanding. Um, and you could do that on the basis of the documentation every company has to publish. And there are quite a few of this documentation available as we speak. They do have to send information to financial agencies, to data protection agencies, et cetera, et cetera. And we know, including from the work of Nicolas Petit that using this financial information, you can actually detect potential infringement to antitrust. So should you be able to analyze lots of those documents using natural language processing, you could potentially detect some infringements to antitrust. And something else that I mentioned is the ability to compare millions of documents, data entries, et cetera, et cetera. So this ties with uh, what I just discussed. A space where we know every antitrust agency can, can, uh, could, could start with is with their own case law, because indeed every antitrust agency has access to at least its own case law. And um, regarding the subject, Bill Kovacic, the former uh, chair of the FTC, wrote a paper in which he argued that it would be a good idea that sometime we look at what happened in the past and try to better understand the practices of competition agencies and try to analyze um, um, if the, the decisions were uh, the right call or if we potentially made a mistake. And so on that idea, uh, we published within the Competition Antitrust Project a paper by two researchers um, uh, from Europe in which they trained a machine learning algorithm, both supervised and unsupervised, 
on top of the FTC case law, especially in the pharma sector. And what they were able to do is to detect patterns of anti-competitive practices and to see that, generally speaking, when companies implement one type of anti-competitive practice, they also implement another type of anti-competitive practice, which is something which was invisible to the human eye. So that's ID number one. ID number two, merger control. Here, we don't have the detection issue. Most companies will notify their merger, but we do have the time factor and also the fact that potentially agencies have to deal with lots of data and they have no choice but to take a decision within 90 days, most of the time. So agencies complain. Those are two of the screenshots that I took on the European Commission website. They complain because they say they don't have all the data, companies send misleading information or incomplete databases. A solution could be to force companies to register some information onto private blockchain and ask uh, access to those private blockchain, knowing that if the company wants to get rid of some information before notifying a merger, this will appear on the blockchain and at least the agency could ask, why did you get rid of half of the database? So that's another solution that we may want to discuss. And something, and here I do have to mention that um, I'm um, mentioning uh, and putting on the screen several of the MIT researchers, including several of the leading researchers in the MIT Competition Law Report, uh, who published a paper for the Stanford project in which they argue that potentially we may want to analyze the technology when it comes to merger control instead of simply relying on thresholds and um, uh, the size of the competitors, et cetera, et cetera. So that's another idea I wanted to put on the table. The final one is the one of policy. So here we could be discussing how to do risk retrospection analysis or how to predict the future. But something I just want to show you is the use of agent-based modeling. Not that I have the time to explain agent-based modeling, but let me just show you how it could look like. This is cellular automata, so the most basic type of uh, agent-based modeling. Here you see that when agents forms a group of 15 agents, they go to the right. Similarly, you could design a simulation in which you would say that if the price of a product goes over the value of 10, then companies move to the right, which is they leave the market. And of course, you could be a bit more sophisticated and use AI and try to see if we implement certain policies, if we allow a merger, what could be the reaction of companies on the market? This won't be perfect, but it seems to me that it is better than relying on the idea of the average consumer, whatever that means, because I never, won, I never met anyone average, uh, and I'm sure you haven't as well. So those are the things that I wanted to discuss. But of course, where I need your help and where agencies and scholars need your help is to address some of the limits of computational antitrust, which is why we have created this project at the Codex Center. Uh, so what we do in just 20 seconds is that we have gathered 55, as we speak, competition agencies. Uh, they agree to receive our publication, to exchange with us, and I receive lots of email from them, including from very small competition agencies, asking very specific questions. And then we organize a uh, annual conference, which is coming uh, in December, where all agencies gather to discuss the advancements uh, in the field of computational antitrust. So we publish one article every month. There is a podcast episode and the annual workshop that I just uh, told you about, knowing that after the workshop, agencies will send us a two pages report explaining the implementation they've been doing of computational uh, tools within the year. But as I mentioned, there are some limits. Limit number one, what, which fields of antitrust law can we compute? Uh, it might be easy when it is related to prices. It, might be, it, might, it could be much harder when it relates to privacy or the quality of a product. This is a question I know Daza wants to ask you. Challenge number two, which tools are we talking about? I've mentioned a few agent-based modeling, natural language uh, pro processing, but potentially we may want to explore all the tools. But of course, designing the tool is not the only thing you need to do. What you also need is the data to fit the tool. And so the question is, who should actually design uh, those uh, APIs to, uh, to uh, improve data flow, et cetera, et cetera. Challenge number three, what's the role of computational antitrust? Let me just draw a parallel with economic science in which George Akerlof, Nobel Prize in Economic Theory, argued in a paper published last year 
that they are important topics that cannot be approached the hard way, meaning with mathematical formula and in a way which rely on neoclassical economic theory. Well, the same is true for antitrust. Some things cannot be computed as we speak. It might be different in 500 years, but as we speak, some of the practices cannot be computed. So what do we do with those practices? What's the limits? And the very last one is to know the limits. Of course, there is no theory of everything, although I do personally believe that one day we'll reach that, but we'll see about that and I'll be dead for sure. Uh, but knowing that there are black swans and events that we cannot predict, then what do we do? And if we have a computable result, uh, what's the limit and what's the weight that we give to that result? So those are a few of the limitations. Something I do want to mention, though, is that the same is true for weather forecast. It's not perfect. There are limits. And yet, if, we, if you rely on it, then you might be able to predict when there is a storm coming and potentially move people away from the region and save lives. And in fact, if you look at empirical evidence, weather forecast is much better today than it was 40 years ago. So I imagine 40 years ago, it probably was a nightmare, knowing that it's not perfect as we speak, but still, it is improving. And it seems to me that the same could be said for computational antitrust. It would improve. And although it's not perfect, this is not a good reason enough not to use it. Because indeed, what we see today is that some of the big tech companies are using advanced tools, while some agencies are not. And it creates, as Richard Posner was saying, a mismatch, which is troubling, to say the least. So potentially, we may want to equip agencies with some sort of fires. But again, I need you to, to discuss which, which type of fire do we want. Uh, if you are interested in the issue for after the talk, you could go to computationalantitrust.com. You have all of our papers, podcasts, everything is open access as it should be. So thank you very much and very much looking forward to our discussion. Here, thank you so much, um, Thibaut, for that tour de force on computational antitrust and especially for taking time to customize some of, you know, what are the really present bigger questions, the conceptual breakthroughs that need to happen to get to the next level. And um, I wonder if you'd be willing to um, screen share again and just put up those questions so people can refresh their memory, um, because um, we did take some time in advance of uh, today to help to craft questions to for you, really. Um, so usually what happens after a talk in a traditional academic uh, or, you know, whatever computer industry setting is that um, the sage on the stage, you know, says things and then the, the people and the pupil uh, in, in, the, in the pulpit or, or rather in the audience uh, ask questions. Um, we want to flip that around today and to encourage idea flow. We have questions for you. Um, and those questions are. One more time, just to frame the, the dialogue. Um, so you mean so that, the four questions, is that right? Yes, exactly. Yes. And I'll, while you're doing that, I'll just riff a little bit. I mean, what, yeah. one, there's a theme here, which is um, with the technologies we already have today, like if we don't assume new breakthroughs in blockchain or quantum computing or whatever, uh, you know, where are the best fits, do, do, do people think? The, the ones where there might be really good value or uh, or where the, where 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 um where um where the, where things are really ready to adopt um we already have data we already maybe know the APIs or the this or the that and if with just one little change we could transform a field of antitrust like um you know the cartels and conclusion and, and collusion stuff or the merger review has a certain kind of shape to it um and and existing data or all the monopoly power and the the price discrimination and the, you know, and the tying of products and stuff has a certain shape to it. So, I mean, we're, what's right for a breakthrough? Oh, and, and now we actually have the real questions. So do you want to just state the questions one more time? And then, um, and then with the help of Mila as our primary discussion, perhaps we can dive right in. Of course. Um, I mean, I think you frame the question exactly how it should be framed. So <laughs> it's hard for me, but no, indeed, the question is, I mean, if you've been involved in a field of antitrust, you know that prices are easier to compute and we've been obsessed with prices, potentially uh, for good reasons, but maybe now is the time that we leave prices aside a bit. And we also care about other metrics such as the quality of a product or 
whether you know there are dark, dark patterns and all of those new issues. And so the question is, if you can more easily compute practices which are prices related, uh, should you go this way because that's the easiest, or should you try to should you develop more tools so that you are able to tackle other issues which are more qualitative by nature? I guess that's the core of the question. And I know we have some uh, um, judges in the room, so I'll be delighted to hear, you know, if not just your your feeling when hearing the presentation, what do you what do you think would make sense? Is there something you want to try within the courts or something that you've tried already? Because some judges have been experimenting a bit. So this is the question. Uh, hi. Well, since you've mentioned the, the judge in the room, I'll just jump right in. And uh, I would actually love to see some artificial intelligence working on uh, some nuclear terms or maybe on the 10 areas of the antitrust qu questions and cases so that we could actually harvest this data on a more concentrated frame. And therefore, we could actually work this data a lot better because sometimes we can think about price and we can think about collusion, but today we must must think as well as like data concentration and other aspects that aren't really focused on a, a specific area, but can actually be very relevant to the market. So I think that we should start maybe with some machine learning um, and actually analyze the decisions and the criteria and the criteria used in the decisions to evaluate what was actually uh, decided as an anti antitrust or anti uh, concurrent practice. Uh, and after that, uh, we could work with blockchain uh, to have the, uh, a very specific uh, way of monitoring this information, not only the criteria, but if the criteria has been actually applied from the decision on and um, I would actually start from that. Just uh, first extract extract the data. I wouldn't actually choose one area. I would, mm -hmm. <laughs> would just search every area because uh, when we evaluate the market, uh, we feel, if we only look at the price, sometimes you can have like a, a not very complete analysis of actually what's going on. So I think that we, we should have just as much information as possible and uh and after that interp interpret and then we, sh we would go on, go on from that from there if if i may ask you a follow-up question then i'll leave the floor to mila because uh, i'm very curious to hear your thought but i mean first of all you you mentioned the the analysis of terms and concept that's a paper that we are about to publish on monday in which they analyzed whether uh, when um, undertakings use the term gatekeeper or dominance, whether they mean the same thing, and they found out that this is not the case, depending on the size of the company, they see concepts in a different way, which is troubling and very interesting. But let me ask you this question. In the first paper that we published, they tried to train a machine learning using FTC and DOJ decisions, but because it's the case law is, is so different, the, the machine got confused. And so they couldn't train actually the machine learning and they had to say, well, we're going to choose just the FTC because for now it doesn't work. So let alone, you know, using the European Commission case law, my question is, would you, and that's something which was curious to me because I always thought, well, first we have to, to make the substance coherent and then we can design the right tools, but it might be the opposite because if you want to make the tools uh, function properly, then it might be the incentive so that the case law is more substantial. So my question for you is, do you think this is a type of argument you could make within the courts? You could say, we need the case law to be more coherent because I need to be able to train the machine learning in a way which is more consistent. Or do you think this argument will never work because this is too geeky for, for judges to, to accept? Well, I, well, I think if, it, if it's a very clear argument and, a very, and actually proposed in a very clear way, it can work out, but uh, it would work out for me. So I can actually speak for my fellow colleagues and sometimes uh, judges can be very different from each other and they have like, for instance, the whole data concentration may not be something that they will care for as long as maybe a horizontal market domination. So. 
um, the case has to be very well exposed mm -hmm. before the court so that this substance can actually show what uh, the case is actually about. Fascinating. Daza, <laughs> the floor is yours. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. Uh, so I was just um, about to back channel with Mila a little bit. So what I'd like to suggest is that we, let's get another idea on the table um, so that we've got some you know, some some things to play with and then bring uh, Mila in as our discussant to help us start to process uh, process this with, you know, together. Um, and that person um, who I think ought to be next is Summit. Um, and so if you'd be kind enough to come off mute and introduce yourself um, and, 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 you, and, um, and maybe you can help us raise some questions which haven't really been um, in focus yet, but how does this all look from the perspective of a consumer and, and how does this play out for like, what, what are the, the issues and the options and the opportunities and maybe the, again, the problems and the prospects from a consumer perspective, it seems like things here could be quite the, the, these, some of these tools and approaches could be really transformative to achieve some of the aims I've heard you talk about with respect to antitrust uh, from a consumer perspective, but again when we start automating things there's perils and you know potentially as well for consumers and i was just wondering if you could say a few words from a consumer perspective to help us bring that into the conversation yeah uh, thanks thanks Daza. so i'm uh, sumit uh, sharma i'm an economist and i work for consumer reports in their advocacy division in in dc washington dc and this has been a very interesting uh uh, presentation, uh, Devo. Thanks, thanks, thanks for the presentation. And I have a couple. So, from the consumer perspective, one of the you know the biggest uh, challenges for us is to explain these issues to to consumers and to the average user. So I have some hesitancy in in sort of uh, fighting a black box with another black box. So I think the question of explaining when we are. Uh, Intervening in markets is important uh, for us as a policy organization to get support to adopt some of these tools. Uh, I did like you mentioned the focus on prices and these other aspects of services like privacy and quality. I think these are usually important in some of the markets, as you all know, you know, on, on, on Google and Facebook, these services are free. So if these tools could be used to analyze uh, and produce concrete evidence on how privacy uh, has changed with competition and how, you know, having just one monopoly provider or two or three uh, providers affects privacy through an, uh, through analysis of, uh, I'm not an expert in computer science, but, you know, mm -hmm. through analysis of various privacy policies and see how they've changed over time, et cetera. Uh, you know, I think uh, that, that would be great. Uh, the other thing is, I think, is there a possibility to use some of these tools to just provide, to study what's happening in some of these markets today? Uh, you know, like prices on Amazon and price discrimination on Amazon. These are, again, I think that there's so many questions I feel that these tools to be applied to before we go into enforcement, uh, that'd be very useful to have. Uh, and my final uh, comment from the uh, viewpoint of adopting some of these tools, it'd be very useful to hear how some of these, how computational antitrust would require fewer resources from the agencies. Uh, you know, it's not easy to get resources for agencies. So if you're saying, let's adopt these new tools and this requires another $50 million, you know, that's, that's not a good sell. But if we can say from a policy perspective, this will help you save money, then I think we have a much better chance of uh, increasing adoption. Uh, thanks. It, 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 can maybe you could help us co process um, some of those are three, you know, yeah. like we could do all day on any one of those three, but maybe you get us started and then let's bring Mila in to help us process that. Thanks. Yeah, I would love to react to that because I mean, <laughs> I've been a bit obsessed with those points. <laughs> Not that I have a perfect answer far from that, but I've been thinking about it. So one thing I wanted to mention regarding the first point is the Google shopping decision. Um, 
which I think is very interesting. And that's the same, the same is true for all of the Google cases before the European Commission, because it will be very hard to argue that all practices are pro-consumer. You know, some of them, you get a feeling that this can't be good for consumers. And yet, if you read those decisions, the European Commission does not explain how consumers are being hurt by those practices, which is very troubling. And I thought, well, let's say that we can actually come up with network analysis and show that the, the layer that Google owns or any other company is actually necessary for businesses and, and try to show the growth and the dynamism of the markets. Potentially here, we could quantify not all of the consumer damage, but part of it. And so it, it seems to me that the European Commission wanted to go this way. They didn't have the right tool at the time and therefore try to say less choice equal, equals bad for consumer, which is a bit of a shortcut because sometimes to have less choice is actually good for consumer because it avoids choice overloads. So this is not as easy as the European Commission, in my view, um, uh, argue in the decision. And yet the practices seems to be anti-competitive. So I just wanted to mention one concrete example, but as you say, I mean, can you measure privacy issues, for instance? So that for me reminds me of a study that, that, it, that was conducted uh, two years ago by uh, Princeton University researchers. They have analyzed, um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, nine southern different websites and identify dark patterns on those websites. And of course, what you will need to do is to conduct the same analysis over time. And um, I've, I'm involved in a project right now where we try to do that, uh, but website change the structure and they change where the information is located. So of course you come up with all of those very practical day-to-day -day issues. But I do agree with you that it will be very interesting to see the change on the market and policy uh, consideration. But again, it involves to conduct the study for, for quite a long time. Um, so that's the type of study that we are conducting regarding, and I won't give name, but some of the um, shopping websites try to see if we could come up with some, some good results. And the very last point regarding the costs, that's the very first question that I asked in the very first episode of our podcast to the researchers. I said, how much? And they said, well, it took us a year um, on top of doing the teaching and all that. So it was quite lengthy for them to train the machine learning. But the cost, they say, were zero. They were able to do it using the, their MacBook. Um, and so it seems that some agencies could actually start there again. It seems to me that coding their own case law, and by coding, I mean just putting some labels on practices and industries, is where they could start potentially just allocating two employees to the task and see if the results are uh, indeed uh, satisfying or not. Uh, it will be m way more expensive, and Daza knows a lot about that when we talk about some other technologies. But there are places where we could start and try to see if it works, and we are working with some agencies to, to try to implement a few of those ideas. Uh, so there are, again, are just some initial thoughts, but um, far from being uh, complete, unfortunately. I'll just, I'm going to butt in one and then write to Mila, but what one thought, Thibaut, to, in hopes that it's helpful is to think in terms of time span when we talk about the adoption and um, the, the yeah. applicability of new technologies to transform a field of law. And so um, when you look at, you know, like one way to look at it is like adoption curve of a new technology. Uh, and so one, and the questions differ depending on and what, when in that cycle of time we're talking, so maybe initially the question is, what is the suite of close to zero or incredibly low cost existing tools just to kind of pluck the low hanging fruit of data we have and, you mm -hmm. know, analytical models and, and other sorts of processes we could just do on a, like on a laptop. And then that sort of raises the question of, you know, <laughs> like what what might it look like for, you know, changing the back end systems and for more industry kinds of things and re maybe registries and other stuff is now we're talking about a lot of staff and security and new systems and integrations. And then you can almost start to imagine, but once we get past that hump and some of that hump will occur as industry and, and society and the economy transforms anyway, that's happening with or, or without uh, computational antitrust and things become, you know, digital first, then what, what are the opportunities to do a little tweak or to add another call to an API or to, you know, tweak a model where you can, you know, maybe get huge value uh, for, for achieving the aims of antitrust toward the end of the adoption curve. But anyway, I just want to throw out there um, the idea of thinking 
in terms of time when we address these questions. And with that, um, it's time for Mila. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Nada, um, what a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for the invite, Thibault. This is long due, right? So many emails back and forth, different initiatives. So it's a pleasure to be joining you on the floor. And also Renata, Summit, and everybody who is in here. So I feel lucky enough to be the one to speak at this point in time because I was observing and something that really caught my attention was that first from a research slash um, administrative side of things we have to both saying should we wonder about like how does competition take place and then we have Hinata, uh, like uh, from the judicial side of things and saying um okay we may be able within the case law or the legislation to rethink the way competition takes place and then we have summit and the first thing that he says is that also from a cons uh, consumer perspective what's needed to be done is to understand how the competition takes place so we are in the fourth industrial revolution we are facing the web 3.0 like effects and how things reorganize so there's a question there's common to everybody who is in this like um you know conversation and i can put my head lawyer on for a second and say of course whenever a new merger control uh, uh opportunity shows up or like an antitrust like analysis case it comes to a law firm we always wonder like how flexible uh the judiciary or the administrative bodies would be like to take a look on that so that drives us to a very like a uh, common point uh, of action but then extrapolating that and trying to think about this um common field but place it in time, in a time of action. I would say that when uh, Thibault was uh, a very, you know, a detailed when he pointed out, okay, there are three areas of competition law that we could think about like doing these innovations, which is merger filings, infringements uh, as a whole, right? And policies. So if we look at the problem that was stated as the most relevant product uh, problem, I would say that the place to look for is uh, data-driven policy. Because if we have data and data driven policy, that means that we understand first that we break the riddle of being like a proactive or reactive that has been joining and accompanying like competition and antitrust for like ages and forever. We break that paradigm for the first time in history and we are also able to learn to understand why we are doing and also have like transparency transparency to like also showcase that to the customers. So I would say, okay, we found the holy and the golden grail, but from a technology implementation standpoint and based uh, of like by what I learned from Daza, not only for today, but I've been lucky enough to be pursuing the guy for the past three or four years, is that this kind of thing, because we are talking about like different, you know, um, databases and so many different, you know, competition areas, sorry, and industries, this is like a ginormous problem to, to handle. So what if we look at the other spectrum of this angle and to the low hanging fruit and think about like merger analysis. So let's consider that today, the whole world would need to talk to an antitrust agency, needs to type in a form. This form is typed in like most of the countries and it's just like a simple word document in which questions that are very similar sometimes are posed with very different like ways or, or, or shapes or forms like the antitrust authorities in the united states brazil i don't know like europe have you seen a form cd it's just like the questions that you ask in a uh, in a filing form in brazil so isn't it such a low hanging fruit to consider that the same structure should or could you know, be uh, put in place by the antitrust authorities when they're requesting information by the players. So I'm not talking about like gigantic, like uh, AI analyzing transparent markets or not in, in public domains. I'm saying uh, the companies are subject to do it and they need to do it and they pay to do it. They pay huge fees. So going to the question on who is going to pay for that? Well, the companies pay already. So what if there is a simple math that says, OK, the cost for doing a computational filing form is X. The filing costs are X, Y and Z in the different countries. Let's all pay like a small fraction of it. And boom, you have your computational global system with privacy in places and respecting like country sovereignty. 
is one very like easy way to address the problem. And I would like to stay more in here, but since I've talked a lot, I just wanted to make time for like a second very small thing. So the place where you have the same type of transparent database and you can see the dynamics of price fluctuation, privacy and quality and ease of access uh, and the competition is called blockchain. Uh, APIs, they are there. You just need to scrape information and start to understand how that, you know, organizes. And with this DeFi initiatives, it may be even easier, you know, for us to understand how consumers relate to two fundamental questions of antitrust, which are price and quality. The third point that you both brought to this conversation was privacy, and it's a much more modern approach. But when we talk about classical and antitrust analysis, please, Master, correct me if I'm wrong. We are talking about like price and quality. And then we have this add up of like privacy, perhaps, or not. But if we're talking about that and we want to do something like very quick, we also have a way using public uh, data and APIs. So, this is kind of what I was looking for uh, and thinking while hearing you speaking like, OK, now that we see what the golden grail is, what are the two quick things that perhaps we could do together to have a little bit more visibility into computational law in the future? Okay. There's a lot there. Um, so, Thibaut, what, what, any reactions? Sure. Um... I mean, I'm, I'm not sure if we even discussed that together, Mila, but I, I very much agree with you that merger control might be the first place where to start. Um, so I didn't want to say that in a way that was too obvious in my presentation, <laughs> but I'm glad we agree on this one. Um, although, again, I mean, it depends on which level you're talking about, but it seems that the form and indeed the basic analysis that we do is something that I have to teach every year to my students doing the same analysis, showing them that it's not complex, although they are, there is a bit of mathematics, but come on, this is quite easy. Uh, and the computer could uh, compute all that in, in a way uh, which is way more efficient. But of course, if you then try to discuss whether we should keep on relying on neoclassical economic theory and the idea that there are equilibrium on the market when there are not, or very often no equilibrium for a long lasting basis, uh, and uh, try to see how to use complexity theory and agent-based modeling. You talk about something which is way more advanced, uh, but we could go step by step and indeed start there. Uh, so in my personal view, if, if I may share, I would say merger control, defining forms, and train machine learning algorithm on the using the case law of uh, competition agencies. Maybe a third will be to use publicly available documentation to try to, to, to come up with uh, NLP analysis and, and detect more practices. This could be done, again, with just a laptop. Uh, so this was uh, my, my uh, first reaction. But again, uh, I mean, we could talk about that for ages, but I'm more than happy to, to leave the floor so I can hear your, your thoughts on that. I, I wish we had more time to think, sorry? Oh, uh, pardon me. I didn't. I, I was just saying that's back to you. But you, you, you were talking at the same time. So, uh, least useful comment of the day so far. Uh, <laughs> um, Thibaut, I wish we had more time. Uh, actually, like to discuss this in advance. I know I probably went like all in. Uh, my idea was just to like spark some, you know, opportunities and possibilities. And not that I see like a way and I know how to push this forward, but putting now my hat of a uh, discussant, I think uh, one of the main roles here is to poke this type of intervention. So uh, I would be also glad to hear from the broad audience, how does that resonate? If they do also feel uh, that there was like this coincidental like link amongst like the different players as regard like I need to understand how competition takes place and then perhaps like leave the how to do it uh, for like perhaps the next section together. I don't know. And if not, I could talk about blockchain for ages. So please don't get me started. <laughs> yes. 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 Oh, okay, so what I, I will throw something in there just to confound us a little bit. And so this is in the spirit of speaking of hats. Ah, okay. So let's get a little hacky and think about uh, some topics that maybe, uh, or, or some uh, 
technologies that exist, but they haven't been configured yet to plumb the value of them. So blockchain we must return to and uh, part of the reason why um it seemed like such a great match to have Thibaut and Mila um in in um guest and discussant roles was because of your thought leadership for on blockchain and antitrust um but i want to but you know there's there needs to be a fuel for um computational methods whether those methods and mechanisms be expressed through the technology of blockchain or um machine learning or you know automation type stuff or or other stuff which is um which is the data you know just like wh where's the where's the data that is the the um you know the inputs for uh, for this uh for these tools uh where is it where is it created uh where does it reside how can it be accessed um how can it be used um and it raises a whole you know legal layer of ownership and control and a whole bunch of other stuff and a lot of technical questions about you know the format and accessibility but uh but so what but one thing that i feel is lurking just below the surface for all of this is we, we start with like the securities filings and and publicly reported data of companies and market data but if we just could kind of tipping the, the a creative hat back towards summit for a moment a lot of it really does have to do with the with consumers and and people that operate within the markets you know uh uh and and they we we have data um and so i guess one thing i wanted to throw in the mix also is um what if um what happens when um not even if at this point uh people start availing themselves of their rights under gdpr and california consumer privacy act and china just enacted a uh, GDPR CCPA like act that gives the and the, the thing these things all have in common is people have a right to get a copy of their data uh, from wh wherever it resides in the market from all of these same not coincidentally companies that we're trying to understand and get data about what they're doing so it, it, it's places like um uh um well um, well, Consumer Reports would be one example of an organization that is seeking to play more of an intermediary role on behalf of and at the behest of consumers to help them exercise their rights. Um, that's a, a project that um, Summit and I um, have been um, um, talking about a little bit in the past. And there's many other organizations around the world that are helping people get their, let's just look at get my data and put it in a data store of some kind. So I have the, the health data, the financial data, my, my commercial data, my location data. Like we have rights to this data. As we start to put them into protected um, vaults, are there opportunities in a permission-based way, in a legitimate way to look across that data almost like epidemiology um but for markets to see things like um well that's this is where i don't know enough about antitrust to say exactly what but you know price is the obvious thing that i think about but are there other trends like opportunities that i had or or you know or or, or, or like you know um um patterns in markets or who knows what insights we might get um from that vantage point of data so i just wanted to mix things up a little bit by, by throwing that out into the mix as well. Floor is open. All right, I, I'll take a chance. First of all, I'm jealous I only have one hat today because you have so many. So that's something I need to think about for the future. Uh, but the um, question- we're, we're going to get law.mit.edu hats for our inner team and our collaborators soon. So stand by, because you have been all such right. a big contributor. So we're going <laughs> to get you that hat, my friend, but go on. Uh, that's great. Can't wait. Um, yeah, thank you very much. That's wonderful. Uh, but I mean, of course, the question of data is is uh, central. Sometimes I think it's not so central, by the way. Um, but here it is central. So a few. Just I would like to make a distinction between three different subtopics. First of all, um, when it comes to merger control, the idea that I mentioned that you could say, of course, it's not. It's probably not for today because. You can't really say to a startup you should store all of your market shares in a in a private blockchain. It might be a bit too complex for them, but potentially in the future this might be a possibility. And uh, here I'm not talking about studying laid ledgers across across an entire market, but just one at a time. When a company wants to merge, uh, you can imagine that this company will have to send or give access to the private blockchain, which which is non visible to competitors. 
uh, in a way to allow the agency to, to see which data is available to make sure that it is not uh, being uh, taken away before sending the, the data set to, to the anti-interest agencies. Because again, that is a common issue and the European Commission will complain about that every three or four months and will sanction a company realizing that the data set was not complete at the time when the company sent it. So that's number one. So where is the data coming from here? You could say it's coming from the company. Something else, uh, which is a bit different, uh, but I've written a paper on that, is how companies could use smart contracts to implement anti-competitive practices. So here, uh, the, the issue is much harder, potentially, uh, knowing that the bytecode of a smart contract without wanting to be too technical is available. But should you try to translate the bytecode of a smart contract into the original uh, source code, it's not actually perfect. And potentially, this is not good enough for an agency to understand what's the, what the smart contract is all about. So uh, this might be something we may want to uh, investigate. But if you start investigating that, you quickly end up with one solution, which I'm not too sure is exactly perfect, which is to create templates for companies to use every time they design a smart contract. Um, and I fear that this might be a way for agencies, uh, even with the best intention in the world, to, to interfere with the conduct of, of business activities. So there is potentially a middle ground, but again, I don't have perfect solutions as we speak. And the very last point uh, that you mentioned to, to study data across the markets, um, there are some patterns that indeed you could, you could try to, to detect. Um, prices is one. Uh, you could say the sharing of markets. You could, you could see that a company is selling product in Germany and France and the US, and suddenly the company is not selling the same product in Germany, and a competitor is selling all of its product in Germany. So there are a few patterns that you may want to detect. Um, and again, the beauty of unsupervised machine learning is that you only give the input, uh, but the output uh, is for the machine to, to find out. So potentially you will detect outputs uh, that were uh, unthinkable for the human brain. So that's the beauty of it. And that's why I think it's very exciting. But just one, one thing in this regard, if you do, and if you ever experimented with using unsupervised machine learning, you may want to say, well, I want you to cluster the data into five clusters or 10 clusters. And if you run the same analysis over and over again, you will find indeed different number of clusters. And it might be that clustering the data into three clusters gives you certain types of clusters which are convenient as an agency or as a company. But if you run the same analysis with seven clusters instead of three, then the results are not at all convenient for the sake of your analysis. So that's where human beings are behind the machine. And that's where potentially we should be able to come up with some sort of procedural fairness. Because thinking that with the machine, you can solve it all, I think is, is a big mistake, but pretty much no one thinks that nowadays. So that's the good news. I wanted to leave on the positive notes. <laughs> Yay, that is good news. And so I, I understand people are uh, needing to drop off now because it's the end of the hour. However, for those of you in the land of YouTube, we did get started a couple of minutes late. So we'll end a couple of minutes late, mostly to make sure that we have an opportunity to thank Thibaut and to thank Mila so very much for um, helping us to um, sculpt the conversation and make it accessible for everyone to contribute. People didn't get a chance to contribute enough because we just didn't have enough time. And um, and so I'd like to ask Thibaut, uh, without imposing too much on your time, if you'd be willing to come back later in the year or possibly early next year to do a kind of part two and take a look at some of these ideas, uh, may maybe after your summit that you're doing in December, um, and to maybe you know further sculpt them in some way, we would very much like that opportunity if if you're up for it. So I only have one condition: I need to have beautiful law that MIT dot edu hat. And if so, I will be delighted, of course, to come back uh, to to continue the conversation. Um, <laughs> you can count on it. And um, <laughs> and speaking of, of wearing different hats, uh, we also have to say. A, um, a heartfelt, um, not goodbye, but farewell to our own TMA, Rogier, um, who's been with us since the start of the, of the MIT Computational Law Report and before that um, in our MIT Computational Law course. And uh, TMA, uh, where are you? Come on, come on out. Um, and she is, why is she leaving? Well, she's beginning her ascension 
to the law itself starting next week at University of Chicago Law School. She's going to, we're, we're about to have a newly hatched attorney of <laughs> constitutional law. Hey, TMA, we're going to miss you. I'm going to miss you guys. I'll, I'll pop in here and there, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, thank you, Tebow, by the way, for such an awesome discussion. I feel like we're going to be talking about antitrust a lot during my 1L year, so. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, yeah, and, and how perfect it is that you'll be at University of Chicago, so you can really really get the foundations of of the economics uh of this whole thing because obviously it is essential to understand it and and to successfully transform so with that i want to thank everybody uh for for um, engaging today in another idea flow and we look forward to continuing the collaboration with you next month on the last friday from 12 p.m to 1 p.m eastern 